get started here today. So we're in the middle of chapter 10. I appreciate that you guys are here. Obviously, this is probably the smallest attended class of the semester, so I don't want to badger you guys because you're here. A few people may be listening to this online on YouTube afterwards um, and missing out on this lecture in person. But, um, but anyways, what I want to start with today is kind of coming back to an idea last time we were talking about gas mixtures. And I want us to envision a problem. We'll look back at the top hat problem in a second, and I'll give you guys a few more minutes in a few uh, minutes from now to finish up the top hat problem. But what I want to think about today is imagine we have a gas container that's connected to another gas cylinder and that we have a valve between the two. And so maybe one of the cylinders has, say, oxygen gas in it. And let's say there's two atmospheres of gas in this container. Let's say it's 2.0 liters in size. So we have a gas, we have a volume, um, we have an, uh, a pressure of gas, let's say it's 2.0 atm, just in terms of you know, sig figs. You know, so we got 2.0 atm. And we'll say this is at 25 degrees C. So we're not like changing the temperatures between our two sides. And let's say on the opposite side, we have N2. And let's say you know, we have three atmospheres. And let's say it's also 2.0 liters. And so I have a valve between the two that I can open. And then the gases can exchange. They're going to exchange relatively quickly because gases have, and we'll see a slide today, they have relatively fast velocities. So they're going to relatively quickly interdisperse and mix between each other. What do you think the final pressure is going to be? Well, you could think your first thought might be five. You know, I have three atmospheres on one side, two on the other. They're going to add together to five. That's not the right answer. Um, you might think, OK, maybe we'll take a simple average. That might be the answer, but, it's, but it could be, but it could not be. Um, so uh, we have to maybe just think about the expansion of one gas into the new volume and how the other gas expands in the other volume. So remember how we had this equation, P1V1 equals P2V2? So what we would have is our N2 expanding from a volume of 2 liters to a total volume of 4 liters. So we'd have just an expansion taking place for the N2. Um, and so let's actually change one number just so it doesn't work out to be an exact average. Um, let's change the nitrogen to be a 3 liter container. So let's say we have 3 liters, 3.0 liters of N2, 3 atmospheres, and then we have 2 liters at 2, uh, at two atmospheres of oxygen. And so for the N2, what we could calculate is initially 3 liters at 3 atmospheres, and then changing to a new volume of 5 total liters. So our, our new volume would be 5.0 liters. So we could calculate our new pressure for the N2 to be P1V1 over P2. So that would be equal to 3 atmospheres times 3 liters. And divide that by the new volume of 5.0 liters for the two volumes once we open the valve and allow the gases to spread out and expand into the new volume. So they have more volume to expand into for the N2. So this is the pressure of our N2 gas after the expansion. So that would be 9 divided by 5. Let's just call it 9 by 5 atm and not um, write that out. I guess it would be 1.8 atm. But so, um, so that's the pressure of nitrogen. What about oxygen? Well, oxygen is going to expand into the volume occupied initially by the N2, but O2 is going to expand. So the oxygen gas is going to expand on the other side of our container. So our O2 will expand. So its P1V1 will change into its P2V2. So its uh, P2 will also be its P1V1 divided by the new V2. And that would be? 2 atm times 2 liters divided by 5 liters. So that would be 4 divided by 5 atm. So that's 0 0.80 atm for oxygen. So the partial pressure of oxygen, so the pressure exerted in the system by just the O2 molecules will now be lower because it's expanded into a larger volume. And likewise, the nitrogen's pressure now is lower because it's expanded into a larger volume. And so that should be 1.8 atm for the new pressure of N2. Now, what's the total pressure? Total pressure would just be the two values summed together. So take 
the partial pressure of your components of a system, the total pressure would just be the partial pressure of your two components added together. So that'll be 2.6 ATM. So we mix the two gases together, started with three atmospheres of one, two atmospheres of the other. The pressure actually ended up somewhere in between the two pressures. Uh, we have oxygen's partial pressure dropping, nitrogen's partial pressure dropping. The two added together wind up somewhere between the initial pressures of each of the two gases. Okay, so partial pressure of your components of your systems added together sum up to the total pressure. Now, we could have had N2 and N2. Like if we had the same gas on either side, nothing changes. Nothing changes because the gas particles of N2 aren't interacting with the O2 gas particles. It doesn't really matter what the particle is. Um, so we could have had N2 on one side, N2 on the other side. The total pressure of the system would be exactly the same after we open the valve and allow the two gases to mix together and equilibrate. OK, so let's come back to for today. Let me see where we're at on top hat. Let me give you guys about two minutes to think about this problem here, because what we're looking at in this example is having a certain mass of helium, a certain mass of oxygen in the same container as each other, and we're just trying to calculate the total pressure. So we're trying to think about what's the partial pressure, perhaps, of helium, what would the partial pres uh, pressure of oxygen be, and we can simply add those two values together. So I'll give you guys a couple minutes to wrap this one up, and we'll review it in a couple minutes. Okay, so our um, main approach here on this one, coming back to the ideal gas law, very simple equation. So we're just solving for pressure, NRT divided by V. So we can calculate 
Uh, I'm taking the mass of helium divided by the molar mass to get the moles of helium. So mass divided by molar mass is moles. Uh, multiply by R.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin times the T divided by the volume. And then we repeat the same calculation for um, oxygen. Now, notice that we have a relatively higher pressure from helium in this system. That's because five grams of helium contains more particles. So five grams of helium contains over a mole of helium atoms, so over 6.022 times 10 to the 23 helium uh, particles. And then oxygen would contain less than a mole. So oxygen is only about one-sixth of a mole, so about one-sixth of an Avogadro's number of oxygen particles or oxygen molecules. So much lower than an atmosphere for the case of oxygen. So once we get the two, we simply add them together. Now, did anybody else approach this problem slightly differently? Anybody take a different approach? Yeah, exactly. So that an alternate approach, and it's perfectly um, an equally valid way to solve the problem, would be to take your total number of moles, so that moles of your helium plus the moles of your oxygen, add them up together, and then take your total moles times R times T divided by V. That'll give you your total pressure. So if you want to take your total moles, you can get your total pressure right off the bat. Maybe save yourself doing the calculation twice. You just have to calculate the two moles and add them up. Okay. A lot of you guys voted. That's good. Congratulations. Okay. Um, so let's take a look here at this problem here. So we did a problem last time where we looked at N2 being generated to fill an airbag from a reaction of like KN3 decomposing to form N2, where our question was we wanted a certain volume of N2. So we could calculate how, much, how many moles of N2 there would be. We related that to how many moles of our reactant to produce it. And we figure out how many grams of the reactant. This uh, question here is kind of similar in a sense that we're taking a solid ionic compound. We're going to heat it up and allow it to decompose into some other compound. And we're going to form oxygen gas. So it's very similar to the type of reaction that we were looking at with the, uh, the, the nitrogen airbag. But the only difference is, is we're using a water collection technique to take the gas that's being generated and bubble it into a beaker, where initially, and maybe you did this reaction in high school, you take a beaker, submerge it in water upside down, and put your tubing underneath into the beaker so that your gas is going to press the water out of the way and fill in the volume of your beaker. And then you do this with a beaker with graduated markings so you can figure out the volume of gas that's been generated by the reaction to then relate that back to how much of the reaction that had to have occurred. Now, the only minor issue here is that our gas here in our system, so our, our gas here, our total pressure, will be due to our O2 that we've created from the reaction. But also, water has a natural vapor pressure. So we're also going to have the water vapor that's present just due to the fact that we're collecting this gas over water. And water itself has a particular vapor pressure depending on temperature. And so the vapor pressure of water at the temperature of this experiment is about 25 torr. So if we remember 760 torr per atm, this is still relatively small in terms of atmospheric pressure. But there is still some water vapor that's going to be collected with our O2 product of our reaction. And so our total pressure in this sort of a system here must equal atmospheric pressure. So like the total pressure of gas inside of our system is counterbalanced by atmospheric pressure. So the total pressure itself is equal to whatever atmospheric pressure is. So depending on the atmospheric pressure the day you run your experiment, the total pressure of the gas you're collecting has that particular pressure. So what we want to be able to do is somehow take the volume of the, the, the gas that's been collected. We want to take the volume of the gas like in terms of the total volume, and try to relate that to how much of the volume is due to O2, how much of that volume is simply just due to the water vapor. And if we can do that, we can then separate how much of the O2 came from the decomposition of potassium chlorate. OK, so now that we have a vague understanding of what's being done here, so we're decomposing a solid ionic compound, generating a gas, feeding that gas underneath a beaker, collecting uh, the gaseous product, and then uh, uh, as well water as it's uh, vaporizing water, we're collecting the sample over. 
so let's look at the problem. So the problem says we're decomposing KClO3. We produce uh, 0.250 liters of a gas collected over water vapor at 26 degrees C. Atmospheric pressure that day was 765 torr. Vapor pressure of water at the temperature at 26 degrees is 25. If you keep heating water up, if we ran this on a warmer day, water's vapor pressure would be higher. So as temperature increases, the vapor pressure, and we'll see this a little bit more in chapter 11, but the vapor pressure of a liquid increases with temperature. So the vapors uh, are the, the gas particles separating from the liquid. That's approaching the boiling point. The boiling point we'll see defined in chapter 11 is the point at which the vapor pressure of the liquid is atmospheric pressure. So like the normal boiling point of water um, turns out to be the point at which water has a vapor pressure of 760 torr. So this vapor pressure here keeps going up with temperature and equals atmospheric pressure at 100 degrees C and hence defines its boiling point. So anyways, for this problem here, we have um, the total pressure being collected 765, but the oxygen partial pressure is much lower. Or not much lower, it's a little bit lower. Um, and so then from this information, can we figure out the mass of KClO3 that had to have decomposed by this reaction to create the oxygen gas. So the very beginning part of the problem is that a very simple analogy that our oxygen gas pressure, the, the pressure that's been collected just to the O2 would be our total pressure minus the pressure due to water. What does that sound? <laughs> Must be somebody moving something upstairs. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, the total pressure, 765 torr, atmospheric pressure that the sample is collected at. So the total pressure of our gas inside the beaker will equal whatever atmospheric pressure was that day. That's a 765 torr. And then we subtract the partial pressure of water. So of that pressure, 25.21 torr of it is due to the oxygen, uh, due to the water vapor um, from the water vaporizing underneath the oxygen gas we're trying to collect. So the pressure of our oxygen is a little bit lower than standard atmospheric pressure that day. So that's 739, call it 740s. So 739.79 torr. And so that's the pressure of our oxygen gas that we've calculated or that we've formed in this reaction. So now we basically know everything we need to know to calculate the number of moles of oxygen that we've collected. Moles of oxygen just comes from PV is equal to NRT. So we now know the pressure of the oxygen. We know the volume that we've collected. And we know the temperature that we collected the sample at. So we should be able to solve for the moles of O2 that have been formed by the reaction. And then all we have to do is relate that back to the KClO3, just like we did in the airbag problem. So we just have to relate three moles of oxygen are formed for every two moles of KClO3 that decomposed, and then we just go back to the mass of our KClO3. All right, let me throw this to you guys at, at this point to try to wrap this one up and give an answer.
Okay, so let's take a look here at this one. So we can calculate the moles of oxygen. We take the pressure of just the oxygen that was collected, convert it to ATM. And I'm only converting to ATM because I'm envisioning using the ordinary units of our 0.08206 liter atmosphere per mole Kelvin. So I need to get into ATM to cancel out the unit of atmospheres and then multiply by the volume of total gas. So the O2 is occupying that total volume of 0.250 liters. So the oxygen gas is still occupying the total volume. Um, so we still use the 0.250 liters, divide by R, divide by T in Kelvin, cancel out our units. We get inverse moles in the denominator that flips up to being equal to moles. So that gives us the moles if we double check our units. Um, and so this works out to be like 0 0.00099, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and so then we get our moles of O2 that way. And then what we have to do is relate that again back to the moles and the grams of KClO3. So what we're really looking for are the number of grams of KClO3. So take our moles that we calculate of O2. For every three moles of O2, we need to have reacted two moles of KClO3. And then the molar mass of KClO3, we're told, is 122.6 grams per mole. So our units gives us just then the mass. So I think that works out to be answer A. So I think answer C is if you forgot to do the conversion of three moles of O2 are produced for every two moles of KCl3 that he had decomposed. So here we just have to relate back the stoichiometry of the reaction for how much of the KCl3 had decomposed. Okay, so we can figure out from the amount of gas collected, we subtract off the water vapor pressure. We're left with just the oxygen pressure, relate that to the oxygen moles, and relate that to the KCL3 moles, and hence the mass of KClO3. OK, so if we push forward into a description of how gases behave and why they behave the way they do, we come to a discussion of the kinetic molecular theory of gases. I think a lot of this thought is what kind of goes into the understanding of just how gases behave, just the idea that when you take a gas and you pressurize it, that you're increasing the pressure, you're probably thinking you have all these particles that are now just bouncing off the walls of the container more often due to compressing the gas. Just like if you expand the gas, you give the particles more of a space to occupy, they're gonna be hitting the walls of the container less frequently, hence have a lower pressure as a result. So kinetic molecular theory of gas describes that gas particles um, involve the, all the particles of your gas in, in random motion that there's a negligible amount of volume that the atoms of your gas are actually taking up. So the actual mass volume that the matter is taking up in a gas sample is relatively small, that it's negligible. And then that there's also relatively few or non-important attractive forces between your gas particles. So when you have an oxygen gas sample, your O2 particles aren't like sticking to each other. They're not forming droplets is sort of the assumption of an ideal gas. And that's just the uh, idea of a gas particle that's traveling around with a relatively high velocity. It may collide. You may have one particle collide with another, but they're not going like, to stick together and be uh, attracted together as if they're trying to form a droplet together. Uh, we could describe the kinetic energy of a gas sample. And a gas sample should have a constant average kinetic energy, meaning that the energy is not increasing or decreasing with time. You may think of some collisions occurring where Maybe you have a fast molecule, hits a slow molecule, but then the fast molecule slows down, the slow molecule speeds up. So the total energy of the system is constant, it's not changing. It's not as if um, the, the molecules are bumping into each other and they're all moving faster. There has to be some consistency in terms of the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energies of the molecules are all constant. In fact, kinetic energy itself is a measure of temperature. So if you have a gas sample, that's at a particular temperature and it's being held at a constant temperature, then the average kinetic energy would have to be uh, equal for the gas sample. And if you were to heat a gas sample up, imagine what you would be doing. What you would be doing is allowing, on average, the molecules to be traveling around faster. So if you start heating a, a gas sample up, the particles will be found to travel with a greater velocity on average. 
And then if you cool a gas down, the opposite happens. They'll be slowing their motions down relative to each other, slowing down so much that at some point they'll liquefy. So if you keep dropping the velocity, velocities of your gas particles, at some point they can start sticking together and it all depends on the particular gas for at which point it would liquefy. Let's think of this scenario here. So let's say we have a gas that's being compressed. That's the idea of having perhaps a gas sample with a piston and you can press down on the piston to compress the gas. And so which statement is correct? Do the collisions between the particles with the walls of the container, does that increase? Do the particles increase in their velocity itself? If you compress a gas at constant temperature, do you make the particles on average travel faster? Or are they traveling at the same speed? So think about these two questions. I'll give you guys a minute or two to think about this one. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. So we're compressing our gas. One of the keys here is at constant temperature. And so in order for the average velocity of our particles to increase, we're gonna have to increase the temperature. In order to make those particles move around faster, we have to increase the temperature, which we're not doing. So we have to increase the temperature to increase the average velocity of the particles. All we're doing by pushing down on our container here is allowing those particles to hit the container walls more frequently by having a smaller volume. So the probability that a particle is hitting the wall of the container, that's really where your pressure is coming from. It's coming from the collisions of the particles with the walls of the container, more collisions with the walls, higher pressure, fewer collisions if we expand the volume, lower pressure. So we're just increasing the number of collisions with the walls of the container. We can't increase the average velocity of the particles though just by compressing the gas at constant temperature. So only statement one here on this particular problem. And so we can think of how um, the t if we take a gas at constant volume, so imagine you have a container that's not going to expand in volume, and you heat up a gas, and you increase the velocity of the gas particles. What also are you increasing when you make that change? 
you're making the particles, because they're moving faster, have a higher probability of hitting the walls of the container. So the pressure would go up if you increase the temperature of a gas at constant volume. So you can think of how the two are connected, how the velocity of the particles could be connected if you can increase them. You just have to increase the temperature to increase the average velocity of the particles. Constant volume container, increase its temperature, particles move faster, hit the walls more, higher pressure. Constant volume container, lower the pressure, particles move slower, hit the walls less often. Hence, now it would be a lower pressure container. Okay, so we can look at the distribution of speeds of uh, a gas. So we can compare the distributions of speeds. Notice even at zero degrees for a gas that its velocity distribution is relatively wide. So you have some particles that are moving re really slow. So some particles are on the slow side. Some particles are moving really fast. On average, you get sometimes what's called a Boltzmann distribution or a weighted distribution where it's a little bit, um, the average is a little bit closer towards the slower end. Because some of the molecules have a really high velocity, you get a stretching out of the velocity, so it's not a perfect parabola shape. So you get a distribution that looks almost like a parabola, but then it gets a little bit weighted on the higher velocity side. Um, and so then if you increase the temperature of the gas from 0 to 100 degrees C, you're just on average making the molecules move with a faster velocity. So the distribution of particles are going to a greater velocity. So we're looking at molecular speed, units meters per second, fractions of molecules traveling with that speed, higher velocities on average when the temperature is increased for a gas sample. So we can define three different types of speeds, if you will, for a molecule, since it's not a perfect parabola shape. Because we don't have a perfect parabola, you might define, well, what's the most probable velocity? That's the one that's the highest peaking velocity. So we get most of the molecules traveling with a peaking velocity um, that's defining the most probable velocity. Uh, we also have an average. You can say, well, of all the particles' velocities, can we just add them all up and take a simple average? That's a little bit weighted on the higher velocity side from where the most probable is. And then one other one, it's kind of hard to, to imagine what this exactly means, but the kinetic energy of your particles, uh, 1 half like mv squared, thinking of this type of an equation here, the, uh, the speed of a molecule whose kinetic energy is equal to the mean kinetic energy of the molecules. Um, that's defining what we call the root mean square velocity. So it's kind of like an average, but it's not the, the, the raw average. It's not the simple average. It's the speed at which the molecules are traveling at the average kinetic energy that the sample has at that particular temperature. And so they're all very close to each other. The most probable is just the maximum of your peak. Now this has a connection to some gas constant. The most probable velocity is equal to the square root of 2RT divided by the molar mass of the gas. So you take 2 times the gas constant R. Let's, let me rewrite this equation. So this equation here, the most probable velocity would be the square root of 2 times the gas constant times T divided by the molar mass. The root mean square velocity also has a connection to these types of numbers. This one's equal to 3RT divide by the molar mass of the gas. OK, so the most probable is peaking uh, where the molecules are peaking out at. We have the highest fraction of the molecules traveling with that particular velocity. So it's the peak of your curve. And then the root mean square velocity is a little bit higher in velocity due to the unequal weighting of this distribution, due to the fact we have a greater set of molecules traveling faster than we do traveling slower relative to that most probable point. So 3RT divided by molar mass for the root mean square uh, velocity, and then 2RT divided by molar mass. Um, as far as I know, there's no simple equation that relates the average. So as far as I know, I don't think there's a simple equation to use to calculate the actual average uh, point. So there's no simple calculation for this quantity here. OK, so we can define our root mean square velocity. Again, let's rewrite this again. 3RT divided by molar mass for that root mean square. Now, we're going to have to pay attention to units here a little bit. This is actually why, and this is the equation I was referring to last time on how there's the other units of R that we sometimes use so that we can get out SI units. We probably want to get our root mean square velocity out in SI units of meters per second. I keep saying SI units. We think SI units for R. ATM is not the SI units for R. And so the other units for R are 8.314. And there's a couple different ways of expressing the units. I like to call it 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. 
there's another unit of Pascal cubic meter per mole Kelvin. So the other way of expressing this was Pascal cubic meter per mole Kelvin. Now that might make sense if you're thinking liter atmosphere per mole Kelvin. The connection to that unit for 8.314 would be that you're converting um, atmosphere to Pascal and a liter to cubic meters, and then um, this is the units then that you would obtain for the, the units of R. Now, a Pascal times a cubic meter works out to be a joule. And now that may not make a whole lot of sense to you, but if you just remember a joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared, and a Pascal is kind of similar in that sense. It's related to kilograms. It's actually meters to the minus one seconds to the minus two. So if you take a Pascal times a cubic meter, so if a Pascal is a kilogram meter to the minus one second to the minus two, multiply that by cubic meters, you get the joule, kilogram meter squared per second squared. And so, because the other way we could look at this is, what we're trying to see is that we get meters per second out from this particular unit and not from the ATM unit. So when we think of joule, we could think kilograms meter squared per second squared, and if you see that in a square root sign, you see where we're getting meters per second from. So we have to get rid of kilograms from this equation and moles and Kelvin. So we'll take 3RT, multiply, of course, by temperature in Kelvin, not in degrees C. So that gets rid of the Kelvin. And then we want to put our molar mass in kilograms per mole. Now, not grams per mole, just simply because if we use 8.314 for our units of R, units are kilograms, meters squared per second squared. We want the kilograms and the units to cancel out the kilogram meter squared per second squared. Now, like I said, we can also calculate the uh, most probable velocity by taking the square root of 2RT divided by molar mass, of course, with the same consideration of units. R, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin, temperature, of course, in Kelvin, and then the molar mass in kilograms per mole. Now, as you look at different gas particles, you could get the behavior, just this simple idea that, think of how things like temperature relate. Obviously, if you increase temperature, you increase the average or the root mean square velocity of the particle. So higher temperature, higher velocity particles on average. Um, and then think about going to a higher molar mass. So if you take a gas particle and compare it with a different gas particle where the gas particle is not heavier, it's going to have a lower velocity. Because the particles get the same average kinetic energy to distribute to their particles, a lighter particle has a faster velocity, a heavier particle has a slower velocity. So the hydrogen has a molar mass 2 grams per mole, helium 4 grams per mole, water 18, nitrogen 28, oxygen 32, you see a decrease in their average velocities due to an increase in the mass of those particles. So if you have a mole of hydrogen, its particles on average are getting the same energy as a mole of oxygen. The mole of oxygen, therefore, with heavier particles, has a lower velocity. You can see that very easily with the equation, too. If you go to a higher molar mass, you have to go to a lower root mean square velocity, lower most probable velocity, lower velocity on average. Okay, and we'll see a couple connections of that to how particles move around each other, and maybe how gases diffuse from a pinhole. Let's first hear where the sample, whether it was hydrogen, helium, was directly impacting. So for a given gas sample of, say, oxygen, the only thing that impacts its velocity is its temperature. But if you switch the oxygen particles to nitrogen, then on average, the nitrogen particles are a little bit lighter, so move around a little bit faster at the same temperature. Problem where we calculate a simple root mean square velocity. Now I'll say this problem is actually quite simple, having me just told you in the previous slide and explained what units you want everything in. But as you solve this problem, just be a little bit mindful of how you're going to remember what units to put these quantities in if you had to solve this problem again in the future. So I think just kind of plugging in your units, seeing how they cancel out, making sure you see, OK, I get why. We want a joule, how that's a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Um, so kind of just using that simple conversion and that's just mass velocity squared, of where that, those units come from, the connection of the joule to the fundamental SI units. So just think about units as you're plugging in so you can see why you get meters per second out from the use of 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin and the velocity in kilograms per mole.
suppose it would help if I open the problem. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, let's take a look at this real quick. Um, so a joule, again, is defined to be a kilogram meter squared per second squared. So the joule per mole Kelvin is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. And so our Kelvin's canceling, um, and that's it so far. So we're plugging in our molar mass. This is, why we, this is what we want to think about, is I want kilograms and moles to cancel. I either need to do one kilogram is 1,000 grams on the top, and then do the molar mass in grams per mole, or just throw the molar mass in kilograms per mole. Like how many kilograms of H2 are there in a mole of H2? It's 2.016 grams, so it'd be 0 0.002016 kilograms. So the kilogram cancels, and then the mole cancels. And we want that to happen so that when we take the square root, we have the square root of just the units meters squared per second squared. And so then that would work out to meters per second. So if we want to get the unit out that we desire, we have to plug in the molar mass kilograms per mole or convert the uh, numerator into grams instead of kilograms times meters squared per second squared. So in other words, we'd have to do 8,314 on the top. And then we could divide by grams per moles. So see, I don't think you're ever going to really get the units right if you don't plug them in and see how they work out and just think that the joule is defined as the kilogram meter squared per second squared, not a gram meter squared per second squared. So plugging in, canceling out the units, seeing how they work here, we get the square root of the number meter squared per second squared, take the square root, then gives us meters per second. I'll give you guys another like minute to wrap up your answer, I see.
a good chunk haven't answered still. So. this graph. We're looking Okay, let's move on. So did any of you guys see the big news about the mole or the kilogram over the weekend? I can't believe there'd be big kilogram and mole news in the year 2018. Um, but they're changing the, the, the international system that defines units and conversions. It's actually going to redefine how the mole and the kilogram are defined. And they're still going to precisely have the same values they have now. But if you recall, back in chapter two, we had defined that the number, uh, Avogadro's number, was defined off of how many carbon-12 atoms there were in exactly a 12-gram sample of carbon-12. Now, you can imagine that such a sample is experimental. Like, you can't produce a 100.00 out to infinity sample of such a carbon-12 source. You know? So like, you have to experimentally make that particular carbon sample. You have to have some means of counting the number of atoms. So all of those things are inherently limited to how precise you can determine. So depending on how you do the experiment, you end up with the number of atoms of carbon-12 being an experimentally determined value. Turns out they decided, why don't we just set the mole to be equal to a specific number? Um, which is about as precise as we had ever counted a number of atoms in the carbon-12 sample. So it ends up being essentially the, the same number we have used. But they're just defining now that a mole is precisely a number that's not based off of some experiment. So I thought that was kind of neat. So I don't know if you guys had seen that or were wondering what the connection was to this class. It actually will make this class slightly easier, though, in a very artificial way that <laughs> won't mean a whole, whole lot. But it'll be very easy now just to look at the mole as a number um, that is just being defined um, to be a very precise number. And it's related to approximately then the number of carbon-12 atoms in an exact sample of carbon-12. OK, so anyways, um, so our discussion here is now on the uh, effusion and diffusion of gases. Effusion relates to the escape of a gas from a pinhole. So if we have a gas with a tiny pinhole where particles can escape, that's effusion. So gas can effuse through a pinhole. Um, and then the rate of effusion is related to a couple things. It's related to the pressure of the gas. But then if you're thinking of a mixture, it's going to be related to which of the gas particles has a higher velocity. If you think of a gas particle that has a higher velocity, it's going to have a higher probability of striking that pinhole and leaving the cell. So if you imagine a light gas particle and a heavy gas particle, the light particle is moving faster, has a higher probability of hitting that pinhole, higher probability of escaping. So Graham's law of effusion relates the rate of escape of one particle compared to another particle. So it relates the rate of escape of uh, particle one compared to the rate of escape of particle two. And it's related to the inverse of their molar masses. So the lighter the particle, the faster the rate of its escape. So the lighter particle has a faster rate of escape. And so this is coming from kind of a, I'm not going to actually bother with the derivation because it's, it's pretty easy to, to, to think about this, but it's just relating to the fact that the root mean square velocity or any of the velocities have that connection to the inverse of the molar mass. So just as the molar mass increases, then the root mean square velocity is decreasing, hence the rate would be slowing down. If you decrease the molar mass, 
then the rate of escape of that particle would be increasing relative to then another particle. Yep, sorry, that was quick. Of a given gas sample. Okay, so but because, like, for example, okay, so rate of escape, we can compare the rates of escape of two compounds, um, and the lighter particle escapes with a faster rate. So diffusion, very similar to effusion, but it's just a slightly different idea. Sorry, do you want? Mean free path is related, but not entirely the same. It's related to some of the same ideas, but here you have a particle uh, that's trying to perhaps travel to some other end of the room. So I think this is best described as like the, you know, you're brewing a pot of coffee that's the this, this scent traveling from one side of the, the house to the other side. And I think as you know, it doesn't take all that long for the gas particles to make their, their, their smells known if somebody's cooking or something. It takes it maybe a minute or two to permeate through the house or whatever. But it's not instantaneous, and it's not instantaneous because the particles are bouncing off of air molecules. So if a particle hits an air molecule, bounces this way, then bounces this way, and the particles are bouncing all around off of air particles as they're hitting the air particles before they make it to maybe the other side of the room and then diffuse across a medium. So diffusion is about taking a gas and having it diffuse across a particular medium or spread out across a room. Um, here, the main connection oddly enough, would be to the actual surrounding pressure. So if you imagine you're cooking in the mountains, which have a much lower pressure, so if you're cooking in the mountains, lower surrounding pressure, less probability that the particles of your scent, say your coffee, are gonna hit an air molecule, because there's fewer air molecules, the pressure's lower. So your diffusion rate's gonna be faster because you've reduced the surrounding pressure. So your rate of diffusion is going to be most related here to the surrounding pressure. So if you make that surrounding pressure lower, the rate of diffusion is going to be faster. And so we can think of that as like mean free path. So the mean free path is how far does a given particle travel before it hits something else? Um, the something else usually being the medium of the pressure it's traveling through, like the atmospheric pressure of the room that the gas is trying to diffuse through. So the lower the surrounding pressure, then the greater the mean free path. So the path is how far or how long the particle travels before it strikes another particle. So on average, that distance is going to be further, the lower the surrounding pressure is. Now you can also relate the diffusion rates to the actual particle itself. You have a lighter particle, it's gonna be traveling faster, it's gonna therefore diffuse faster. So your rate of diffusion will still be directly proportional to the inverse of the molar mass. So if you make the molar mass smaller, you make the particle on average travel faster, it's gonna diffuse with a faster rate. So rate of diffusion with a lower molar mass makes for a faster rate of diffusion. So again, lighter particles, faster velocity, faster rate of diffusion. Now a question on this topic could be relatively simple. Um, and I think this question here is of that variety. So we're just thinking of the gas that will if used the fastest from say a pinhole and it's higher, we have O2, CO2, N2, or they all fuse at the same rate. So think, of, or, uh, think about this one here. Which one diffuses the fastest?
So for the three gases here, O2, CO2, N2, obviously CO2 is the most massive. So that particle would have the slowest root mean square velocity of these three. Um, the O2 would be the next slowest root mean square velocity. And then N2 would have the highest root mean square velocity. The lightest particle travels with the greatest velocity. So it's going to have a greater probability. So the nitrogen molecules in your tire um, would be traveling around with a faster rate and have a higher probability of hitting the pinhole um, in the tire. So they're going to be the particles that diffuse faster than the other two. Now, one of the things that's kind of interesting, if you go fill your tires up, um, some car shops will try to scam you into p filling your tires with pure nitrogen, which is kind of silly in a way because air is already 78% nitrogen. So look what, what's the big deal of making the remaining 21% O2 versus uh, N2? Um, it could be that you just want dry air going in. So having like dry air instead of having water vapor might be more beneficial to not destroying your rims. But has anybody ever had to change your rims because they all got rusted out from filling them with air? That's never been a problem I've ever had. Um, so cars, and they actually charge quite a bit to fill your tires with nitrogen. And nitrogen is very cheap. It's air, you know? Um, so it's uh, a gas cylinder or nitrogen doesn't even cost that much money. They'll charge you like $14 a tire at some places to fill up with nitrogen gas. But you know what's funny? They will say it's because nitrogen effuses slower, which makes no sense. Like anybody who's taken general chemistry would be like, that's nonsense. You want to know what mistake they make? Anybody want to take? Like nitrogen versus oxygen, which atom is bigger? Just N versus O in terms of atomic size. Like nitrogen's bigger than oxygen. If you're just saying an atom of nitrogen compared to an atom of oxygen, nitrogen's bigger. What about N2? Like N2 has a triple bond. It's, it's smaller. N2 molecule is smaller than O2. O2 is bigger in terms of a molecule. N2 is smaller. That has nothing to do with the nitrogen size versus oxygen size. It all has to do with the triple versus double bond. Nitrogen is smaller, so it's going to fuse faster because it's smaller, faster because it's lighter. Makes no sense. So I don't know. Hopefully I, I saved you some money. If you get anything from this class, don't fill your tires or pay extra money to fill your tires with nitrogen. <laughs> OK, so let's um, get into real gases. Um, so real gases can be described by the Van der Waals equation. And so the Van der Waals equation looks kind of like this. So it tries to correct for two different things. OK, so we have basically PV is equal to nRT. So we still kind of have a pressure times volume equals nRT. So we're kind of starting from an ideal gas law equation. And then we have two corrections that are being made. We have one correction being made where we're adding in this n squared a divided by uh, v squared. And so if you look at units of a, notice how it goes liter squared ATM divided by mole squared. And so that's so that we can multiply a by um, n squared, so that's mole squared, so that's going to cancel out the mole squared. And then we can divide by liter squared to cancel out the liters and get ATM. Now what A is trying to describe are or relate to the intermolecular forces that are po uh, present within a given gas sample. So if you look at A, what A ends up being proportional to is the strengths of intermolecular forces. We call those IMFs, so that's intermolecular forces. So as a given gas particle has a greater attraction for itself. So the whole idea that gases behave ideally is an assumption. Um, and it's a pretty good assumption. It works pretty well. But at some point, we obviously know if you keep dropping the temperature of a gas, it'll liquefy and it won't be a gas at all. So the ideal gas law is not going to describe a liquid very well. And it's not going to describe a liquid very well because it will be behaving as a liquid, not as a gas anymore. And so the molecule that's going to liquefy first generally will be the one that has stronger intermolecular forces. So if you think of starting at room temperature as a gas, start reducing the temperature, the first gas to liquefy will be the one that has the strongest affinity for itself. The one that liquefies at the very temperature closest to zero Kelvin 
is going to be the one that has relatively fewer, the fewest intermolecular forces. It's like helium has the lowest uh, melting point and boiling point of any substance, and that's one Kelvin for the melting point, like four Kelvin for the boiling point. Hydrogen is, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's, it's higher than helium. So helium noble gas, we saw the helium molecule doesn't really attract to itself at all. There's no bond between two helium atoms. That's kind of the problem for helium, is it being a noble gas. And it's also a problem that, that it's small. Um, we'll pick up in the next chapter, in chapter 11, that as a, um, as like a nonpolar type substance grows in size, that it'll be more attracted to itself. That'll be the main explanation for why F2, Cl2, Br2, and I2 increase in boiling point and melting point like we saw back in chapter seven. So the main issue here will be if you have two adjacent like nonpolar molecules that don't have like a built-in charge or attraction with each other, the bigger they are, the more attracted they can be by pushing each other's electrons around and kind of inducing a dipole moment with itself. So A is kind of growing with size of molecule, but also with the polarity of a molecule. So if we look at the relatively like polar molecules, like water, NH3, much higher A values than our gaseous, nonpolar um, noble gases. And so then, um, likewise, the B value, what it relates to is the actual space being occupied by the matter in, a in, in the gaseous substance. So if um, if we were to plug in our free space and say, instead of using the container volume as our volume, what if we subtracted the space occupied by the, the matter and just take that difference? That would be the free space volume. So our free space volume is what we get by taking V minus N times the sort of inverse molar volume of a gas. So it, what B is trying to tell us, the constant B in this equation is trying to tell us for a mole of gas, what's its volume? So if we had a mole of the gas, how much volume would it take up? And so in the case of, say, neon, it would be 17.1 um, milliliters, or 0.017 liters. And so not much of the container, if you have a relatively low pressure, would be taken up by the mass of like, the neon atoms. But as you pressurize a gas, as you put more and more gas into a container, the B problem is going to become a bigger issue. The, Obviously, as you go to a higher pressure, the matter is going to be taking up a larger and larger percentage of the volume. OK, so what, what uh, the P plus N squared A divided by V squared is trying to correct for, this is trying to correct for the intermolecular forces. So it's kind of in a way, like if you imagine uh, a gas sample has particles like stuck together, like the plus N squared A divided by V squared is trying to like re-add in the pressure that's lost by molecules sticking together. Like we're kind of like losing pressure if the particles stick together. Um, from our gas mixture, like compared to the ideal gas law. Ideal gas law says if you have a mole of gas, you have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 individual particles. If some are sticking together, the number of moles is really lower. The pressure is going to be lower as a result in your real system. The P plus N squared A divided by V squared is reconsidering or calculating back in those lost intermolecular forces due to the molecules that might be sticking together. V minus NB is correcting for the free space issue. It's cor correcting for the size of the molecules. So B is proportional to molecular size or atomic size. So like um, a larger noble gas is bigger than a smaller noble gas. So B is proportional to the size or the molar mass of the atom. We also see that if you can stretch out atoms and have three nuclei instead of one with a relatively similar mass that the B grows in size as well. So it's going to, you know, having multiple nuclei will take up more space than having just one single nuclei. So just a couple connections to the actual properties of matter here. That A, proportional to like polarity, proportional to size a little bit as well we see. B, proportional just mostly to the size of the molecule. The P plus N squared A divide, uh, um, multiplied by V minus NB. So we probably want to divide by this first. And in, of course, these would be given. We wouldn't expect you to memorize these numbers. But 1.39 for A, 0.0391 for B. OK, so the, one of the problems here is relatively simple. Before we actually address this, let me, let me do a demo just so we can make sure to get the demo finished. This problem is relatively straightforward to this problem here. So the idea here might be to compare two kind of scenarios. Let's talk about this for a second before we go plugging some numbers in. So we have PV is equal to NRT. That's our ideal gas law. So 
gases that obey the ideal gas law fit this equation, so that's kind of circular. But an ideal gas is one that's described as having relatively weak intermolecular forces between the atoms uh, or the particles and of a relatively low pressure so you don't have this free space volume issue. So you're going to have the best agreement here whenever a gas is relatively high above its boiling point. So you can think of like boiling point relative to the pressure of the gas. As you get closer to the gas's boiling point and you reduce the temperature, we're going to have a bigger problem with the ideal gas law being satisfied. That's going to be due to like droplets beginning to form as you're approaching the condensation point, that boiling point of the liquid. And then likewise, we're going to have a big problem for a different reason at high pressure. So at high pressure, we're packing more and more gas particles into the container. They're taking up more of a volume of the container, so we have more of an issue with the volume um, aspect due to the B constant. So we can compare here, here and calculate the pressure we would get for N2, 5.50 moles, 0.60 liter container, 298K, using our two equations. So the ideal gas oil equation, very easy. NRT divide by the volume. And so if we plug that in, that works out to be 0.6, or excuse me, 5.5 moles times 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin, 298 Kelvin, divide by 0.6 liters, that's 224 ATM. <laughs> And so that's the pressure we would expect applying the ideal gas law. And then if we're calculating the pressure with the Van der Waals equation, so, so if we're trying to calculate our pressure, we might start with this. And then get rid of this term here. So minus n squared a divided by v squared. OK, so what we would want to do is just plug in the moles wherever we see n. So we're plugging in 5.5 moles for n. That's in three different spots. The temperature is pretty obvious what we're plugging in. R is still the same, plugging in the same gas constant. We just have to look up the a and b constants from the chart. I'll grab those in just a second. And then we're plugging in the volume of our container in both spots here. You know, so you don't make the volume correction in the intermolecular force terms. You might think, do I plug in the free space volume or the container volume? Uh, generally, you plug in still the container volume in both spots for V. And then we just, I've already forgotten. Zero point zero three nine one per mole. Okay, so um, we could plug those numbers in. In fact, why don't we end with that by trying to calculate the pressure? So if, if you want to try to calculate the pressure, I'll try to calculate it too. I'll write it out as well. So for the first part here, we're just correcting 5.50 moles times 0.0391 liters per mole. So our gas is taking up about a third of the volume at this high pressure. And so our free space is only about 0.38 liters.
So if we just fix the volume issue, we would expect the pressure to be 349.3 atm. So higher than we predicted with the ideal gas law equation, then we just have to then subtract 5.50 moles squared times the A value divided by the 0 0.600 liters squared. So this is 116.8. Just do 349.3 minus 116.8. Okay, so you can wrap the number up pretty easily. So, so you just do that difference and see what it works out to, and you get a slightly improvement of your calculation of your pressure with the Van der Waals equation. All right. Um, have a great Thanksgiving break. I'll see you guys back here next week. And so that gives us a Van der Waals pressure equal to 232 atm. Okay, so the Van der Waals equation gives you a slightly better approximation of your pressure compared to the ideal gas law. Ideal gas law is neglecting intermolecular forces. Van der Waals equation tries to correct for that with the A constant. And then the ideal gas equation neglects the size taken up by the molecules. And the Van der Waals equation tries to account for that through the inverse molar volume, through the B constant of the molecules. Don't completely finish it as well. I also wanted to throw out that whenever you're studying or wrapping up a chapter, you can always go to the textbook, review the chapter summary. You can look at the learning outcomes. Looking at these often might be helpful when you're studying just to get a sense of, okay, what is it that we want you to be able to do? Like calculate pressure, convert between pressure units with an emphasis on TOR and ATM. Like we'll expect you to convert between TOR and ATM without being given conversion factors. And it's very easy. We did it today and I, I think you probably get that conversion very easily. We're not going to expect you to convert to Pascal without conversion factors. You know, we're not going to expect you to memorize a bunch of conversion factors here. Um, if we give you three of the four variables for the ideal gas law, you should be able to calculate the fourth. You know? So if we give you three of the four variables, you can apply the ideal gas law. You can think of gas laws, how they impact each other. Um, and so you can read through these as often as you need to to help you keep your focus on the big picture, the big problems that we hope that you're able to solve using. So let's go to 1.39. Take a look here. So the, uh, uh, Michigan's coming to town, so this is our Ohio State Michigan demo. So, um, how many of you guys are going to the game on Saturday? Cool. Um, so, Michigan's coming to town. Or, I'm not even supposed to say that name. Um, that team up north is coming to town. Or, X Michigan, I don't know how to say that. X would be the letter that I'm to say. Um, so, they're coming to town. You guys are actually supposed to boo at this point. <laughs> So when was the last time, you don't even think about it, you guys were so little, um, most of you were so little the last time Michigan won in Columbus, let's keep that going. Um, what's gonna happen on Saturday? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Florida State? I think they may. Well, anyways, I think Scarlet and Gray will come out on top on Saturday. <laughs> just as they have since, I believe, 2004 or something. <laughs> it's insane. Okay. Uh